TurboLift is a SSP that specializes in creating ad experiences that are better for users, better for publishers, and better for advertisers. So ad experiences by creating better user experience end up retaining users longer on the page. They help publishers monetize better and they help advertisers get better performance. So the sort of first product that TripleLift invented was programmatic native. Uh, we've also expanded into sort of an omni-channel ad tech suite. Uh, we have a branded content product uh, and we're really innovating new ad experiences in OTT through our OTT brand integrations products. So the core thesis of the company is inventing new and innovative ad products to create better engagement for uh, users, better monetization for publishers, and better performance for advertisers. So in the uh, SSP area of OTT, let's just focus in on your work there. There's some fairly advanced, well-entrenched players. Uh, how do you define your offering? Yeah, OTT is a really interesting space. Completely different dynamics than the rest of the market. Uh, if you look at things like display uh, or even native, it's very buy side driven, as in the buyers are making decisions where they want to invest money because there's ultimate fragmentation among players in the market. As it pertains to OTT, the market is much more consolidated. And at the top end of the market with premium players, there are a small handful of players that really matter. And when buyers buy OTT, they sort of know what they want to buy. Uh, it mu works much more like uh, linear television in that way. So the, the market dynamics are, are quite different. And as it pertains to our strategy there, it's really two pronged. One is to engage with sort of the traditional ad products, 15s and 30 second spots, and create products for publishers that allow them to sell PMPs and the like to buyers more efficiently. And the second is actually taking a non-interruptive approach to advertising. So if you look at OTT publishers today, they're sort of squeezed in an interesting spot where they have to pay a lot of money to acquire content to show users. So they're paying out a lot of money to get the content. But at the same time, they have to fight other streaming providers, other OTT providers for users, which means that they have to keep their ad load fairly low. So they're sort of pinched in this impossible position where they're paying out a lot of money, but they're not making a lot of money. And the sweet spot there is non-interruptive advertising where we can allow OTT publishers to make money without increasing their ad load and in a way that is natural and friendly to the user experience. So what does that look like? How does that work? Yeah, so there's, there's four different ad experiences that we're pioneering. Uh, we actually recently built out our advanced advertising division led by a gentleman named Michael Shields who came over from Fox Networks where he led the advanced advertising business. Uh, but there's four different ad experiences that we're pioneering. Uh, one of them is sort of like an overlay product, which is pretty familiar. People have seen that with tune-in notifications. Uh, one is what we call an inaction six or a squeeze back, where during a natural break into programming, we'll squeeze back the content play an ad side by side. And a lot of that ad experience is being used by a lot of the major networks now for sports and the like. Um, the other two are sort of more immersive experiences where we'll do a brand integration. So on a flat surface, like a digital billboard, we'll insert a, a picture of a, of a brand into a existing television stream in a post-production way. Uh, and the last one, is potentially the most interesting and most compelling where we actually do product insertion. So we'll you know, programmatically ingest a uh, show. So a showrunner will send us a show. We'll scan it and using AI machine learning detect where the opportunities are to insert 3D objects into the stream. Uh, and we do it in a way that doesn't affect the narrative or storyline. Uh, it works very well with non-scripted content. We can actually inject 3D objects on behalf of advertisers into the stream. And we have a team of compositors or uh, engineers that will actually take a stream. And I, I used to sit behind one of our lead UX, uh, uh, lead VX engineers, uh, and he would 
insert products into the stream where you'd have no idea that it was inserted in a post-production way. Uh, and it would look as if it was filmed with that object uh, in the stream. Um, now, don't get me wrong, this, uh, this business exists. So pre-production brand integration exists. It's, it's actually a large business. Uh, but being able to do this in a post-production way, and potentially even a way that's addressable, uh, is totally new. And that's what we're innovating here. Yeah, so from the SSP perspective, we work with the vast majority of CompScore 500 publishers, uh, just like any other major SSP would. Uh, we're actually quite a large SSP in that regard. Um, as it pertains to specifically the OTT space, uh, we're leaned in with all of the major OTT publishers that are embracing programmatic. Um, some of them have taken sort of a walled garden approach where they're not working with third parties, um, but there are many who are embracing third parties, uh, specifically like open ad tech participants that we've begun to meaningfully engage with. And that's both for sort of standard media products, so the 15s and 30s OTT spots, uh, and also increasingly with the OTT brand integrations, sort of novel experiences. Uh, and there's actually some cool synergies between those. Uh, and I think you know, one of my personal hypotheses is that those products will be bundled in the future. So, uh, you know, we've actually done some very interesting consumer research where we found if you see a product insertion and then you also see a traditional ad for the same product, it has a knock-on effect in terms of brand recall. So it's, you know, one plus one equals three in terms of impact. Um, so that, that's sort of the, the footprint. We have a fairly large publisher footprint um, and it's growing every day. Great. And I just wanted to talk about identity, the identity graph, what that means to you guys, uh, how you uh, activate um, against one-to-one -one advertising, um, and what the identity graph means to Triple Lift. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think as it pertains to privacy and identity today, what I see is really the clash of two macro trends that are coming together. The first pertains to marketer first party data. And you know, there's effectively marketers with data and those without data. Uh, and those without data are scrambling to become marketers with data. And those with data are the ones that you know, have spent a very large investment collecting things like email addresses and phone numbers when customers visit their website or have interactions with the brands. So there, there's this sort of one trend that's been happening for about five years where marketers without data are really trying very hard to get data on their customers. Uh, I think a lot of marketers are doing really great work there. The second trend pertains to privacy and identity in the programmatic space. So at the same time as these marketers are getting more and more data about users, the way they can activate that data is becoming more and more limited. And I think privacy identity is gonna be the defining topic for programmatic or really all digital media in 2021. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of the changes are probably driven more by commercial interests than by actual privacy concerns. Um, and I was just looking this morning about how some of the walled gardens are responding, sort of the, the difference between how they respond to third-party cookies versus uh, IDFA deprecation. Uh, and I think that's sort of a really interesting dichotomy uh, because it's sort of unlikely that the deprecation of third-party cookies is really going to hurt major walled gardens with deep pockets but it's relatively more likely that IDFA Apple deprecation is gonna hurt uh, major walled gardens. And I think you can sort of look at the difference in response to those two things by some of the major walled gardens as an indication as to you know, how the uh, commercial interests are really driving uh, activity. So you know, on one hand, you have marketers that are scrambling to get more data. The other hand, there's more, uh, more and more limitations on how they can activate that data. Uh, and then to sort of throw gasoline on the fire, I think, the preparation, uh, the, the, the degree to which marketers are prepared to deal with these changes is uh, you know, something that's very sort of scary. Uh, and my personal hypothesis is, you know, in 2018, there was GDPR and there was a lot of noise about limitation and privacy in 2018. And candidly, from a marketer perspective, I think that GDPR probably had much less impact than folks thought. Um, from a publisher perspective, it had impact. From a marketer perspective, I think it had less impact. So I think publishers, I, I see taking the privacy and identity changes very seriously because they understand that this could have meaningful and lasting impact on their business. I think from a, a marketer perspective, the vast majority of marketers, I think are, are very underprepared to really grapple with the magnitude of change that 
privacy and identity changes are going to have on their business in 21. Uh, and I think that's going to be uh, you know, certainly a really big focus for TripleLift from a product roadmap perspective. Uh, but I think it should be really focused for everyone in the industry.